Hey there, chemists. Uh, we've been looking at how to make substitution reactions occur on aromatic rings. And in this lesson, we're going to continue that, but specifically talk about what's called a diazonium salt, which is this type of functionality attached to a aromatic ring. We're going to look at how we put it on the ring and then how we can use it to do special types of substitutions where we specifically replace the diazo with uh, a different kind of group. They actually start not from benzene, but from aniline. So we can only use this if we first make aniline. So it's actually worth showing just how you make aniline in the first place. I'll just sneak it into the margin here. Uh, anilines are made from reductions of nitro benzenes. You do that with hydrogenation and uh, the rainy nickel catalyst. That's one way to do it. And nitrobenzenes are made from, from benzene. We learned that on the first day of substitution reactions with nitric and sulfuric acid. So just a refresher of how you could put some reactions back to back uh, to make an aniline molecule. And then you can turn that aniline into a diazo uh, using a solid sodium nitrite and a strong acid like sulfuric acid. Like many of the reactions we've learned today, the first step involves just the combination of the reagents. So I'll draw out the nitrite ion. And in the presence of a strong acid, you protonate this actually twice. I'll show one at a time. We first make nitrous acid, but then it protonates again. So you get protonated nitrous acid, which we could draw like so. That water molecule attached to the nitrogen can then leave. You could even donate a lone pair from that oxygen. That's just a resonance arrow. And then you get a very little binary molecule called a nitrosonium ion. And that's just from the combination of those two reagents. That's the first part. And the nitrosonium ion is what's seen by a benzene, or specifically an aniline. So now we have an aniline. This actually works with a lot of different amines. We're just going to use it on aniline specifically. But when the aniline sees the nitrosonium, the nitrogen will attack the nitrogen. If you look up above, that's what we need to do. We need to make a nitrogen-nitrogen bond. There's our new nitrogen-nitrogen bond. I still have two other hydrogens on the original nitrogen of the aniline, so I still have a plus charge. Now it's on that nitrogen. And if I stop and look for a second and compare what I have here with what I want to get to, I have to make extra bonds between the two nitrogens. I need to lose two hydrogens, and I need to lose an oxygen. Ooh, so I need to lose a water. That's what I'm thinking as I'm trying to get to this mechanism. So to do that, we're going to do a couple of proton transfers, show some resonance stabilization, and make those extra bonds. So a proton transfer, remember, probably happens intermolecularly. I'm just going to shortcut it and show it intramolecularly, but it really probably happens in two steps. They are very fast, and we've seen them in a variety of different mechanisms, and we're going to continue to see them. It's just from a hydrogen jumping from one heteroatom to a different heteroatom, in this case going from a positively nitrogen, positively charged nitrogen to a neutral oxygen, and now that oxygen has the plus charge. This is a resonance stabilized intermediate, and that will let us see how we start to get extra bonds between the two nitrogens. So I can change that nitrogen-nitrogen single bond and draw a different contributor with a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond. Everything else stays the same in resonance. As a result, my formal charge is now on that nitrogen. We're getting closer. I'm not quite to this. I still need to actually lose a water, which means I need another proton transfer. So we're going to repeat this. A second proton transfer will happen. I'm going to cheat again and show it intramolecularly, but it probably happens in ter. But what that means is now that oxygen on the end 
is positively charged and it's now a water molecule. So it can leave and a pair of electrons on that first nitrogen can donate. So at the same time, we get rid of our water molecule and we form our triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms. This is the diazonium species that we can now use to do substitutions. That's just how you make it. Even though it's a cation, there's gonna be some counter ion with it. So sometimes it's drawn with the ion that's in this case, just a spectating ion. For our purposes, it would be a sulfate, but it could be a chloride or any other fairly stable anion. So that's how we make the diazonium. Now we can do substitutions on the diazonium. The whole point is we can turn that diazo group into something else. One of the most useful things is we can make a phenol out of this. You can substitute the N2 group for an OH. This is the only way you know how to make a phenol for now. This actually happens with acidic water, not just H2O, but H2O under acidic conditions. Depending on the type of reaction that's used, the mechanism either involves a cation at this carbon or a radical at this carbon. So I'm just going to show one example of what happens with a diazonium that involves a cation. It's called a phenyl cation mechanism. But just under high temperature, if you heat this up, you can get that nitrogen molecule to leave. Just like water is a good leaving group, the nitrogen molecule is frankly an even better leaving group, and you get a phenyl cation. Not a very stable cation, so it does not sit around. There's no resonance with that. That's not allylic. That is right on the carbon attached to the double bond, so very unstable cation, which means if any water molecules are around or anything that's nucleophilic at all sees this, it will attack that cation right away, and that's how we get our new carbon-oxygen bond. almost looks like an SN1 style in terms of the arrow pushing, and the arrow pushing is the same. In fact, that's how it finishes up. We lose our last hydrogen from just another water molecule in this case, just like we saw back in the days of SN1 substitution reactions. Similarly, the kind of thing happens here. And that's how you get your phenol. So very simple mechanism for the actual <clears throat> substitution. And then there's just a lot of other things that one can do with this. You can replace the diazo with any halogen. We can put an iodine, a bromine, a fluorine, or a chlorine in its, in its spot, uh, mostly using sources of copper to do those. Those often involve radical-based intermediates. I'm not going to show those in the interest of time. Uh, we can also replace them to make a nitrile. That's what the cyano group is also called. We haven't learned what we can do with nitriles yet, but when we do, we'll see that this is actually very useful because you can functionalize a nitrile with a lot of different things. It's a great way to homologate the molecule. And we can even replace this back as an original hydrogen. Uh, a diazo is also a masked hydrogen. So if we wanted to put a group on and be able to essentially take it off of the ring, you can replace it back with a hydrogen uh, with what's called hypophosphorous acid. Very useful transformation, particularly if we need to put multiple things on the ring. Remember from the previous lesson, the diazo group is meta-directing. So if we were to use this particular molecule and do substitutions elsewhere on the ring, it would want to go in one of the meta positions relative to the diazo if it's doing a traditional electrophilic aromatic substitution. So that's how we make a diazonium, and that's how we do substitutions with it.